สวัสดีครับยินดีที่ได้ร่วมงานในสัมมนาในวันนี้ผมขออนุญาตนะครับต่อไปขอพูดภาษาอังกฤษเพราะผมภาษาไทยยังไม่ค่อยคล่องมากนะครับ I'm delighted to be here with you today to talk about the future uh, path for sustainability in an increasingly volatile world. The world today is very different from the world in which the Sustainable Development Goals and the Paris Climate Agreement were agreed in 2015. And by 2030, the world again will have changed significantly from where we are today. Indeed, we live in a world where change is accelerating. And in order to navigate the turbulence and the uncertainty which comes with this accelerated change, it will be imperative to have a clear map and a robust compass to guide our actions. And I want to invite you today to think radically about what sustainability means for you and for your organizations. And by radically, I do not mean, I do not mean that in the sense of um, reckless um, disruption, but I mean it in the original sense of the word, which really means going back to the roots, going to the root of things. So I want to invite you to break out of the iron cage of the here and now, to step off that treadmill, and to think about the root causes of unsustainability and our roles individually and as members of organizations, as change agents, in laying the foundations of a more inclusive, sustainable, resilient future economy for us all. So in the first part of the talk today, I will look at the landscape of action and how that is rapidly changing and uh, what matters for, for our endeavors to advance the sustainability agenda in the critical years ahead. And in the second part of the talk, I want to, talk, I want to engage with you on what is required of, of us all to get to a more resilient and inclusive future economy and what steps we can already take today. So first, maybe a quick word about my organization to give you a sense of where I'm coming from. Um, I worked with the World Resources Institute, which is a global, independent global research organization uh, that works with governments, with business leaders, with cities around the world to devise and implement transformative solutions that help create a more inclusive, resilient, and sustainable economy for tomorrow. So we really specialize in the business of turning intractable sustainability challenges like climate change, like deforestation and water scarcity into irresistible business propositions and business models. And we do that with co companies by helping provide them with research, with the tools uh, to measure, manage and improve their risks and impacts throughout the supply chains. And we create, help create standards for good business practice and to strengthen business sustainability performance. And these are some of the companies that we work with uh, around the world. Not many Thai companies, incidentally, and so I'm, please consider this an invitation also to engage from my organization. What turbulent times we live in. The, the pandemic is, continues to wreak, wreak havoc around the world. We've seen it dis disrupt lives and economies. 15 million excess deaths have been recorded since the beginning, and as we all know, these numbers are still ticking upwards and the cost to the economy has already been in the order of $25 trillion. And as we have seen, and as always is the case, it is the poor who bear the brunt of impacts from, from this disruption caused by. What the pandemic has also done is laid bare the shocking inequalities in our system. We are also in a world where climate impacts are already upon us. At the time that the Sustainable Development Goals and the Paris Agreement were being agreed, there was still a very lively debate about how we manage these future risks and the future disruptions that climate change would bring. That is no longer the case. We are very much in the reality of escalating climate impacts. We have seen it. We see it almost every day when you turn on the news. Uh, recently, the fires in my home uh, city of London, where I live, not very far from where I live, uh, entire neighborhood uh, combusted into flames as a result of a sweltering heat that has never been recorded in history. And by the way, the UK is the first country to initiate records for temperatures. So this is a truly, 
truly historic first. Likewise, fires sweeping across the forests of the world, even in cold places like Sweden, and of course the Amazon, which is the lungs of the planet, which is, plays such an important role in regulating our global climate. We see vast chunks of the Amazon now shifting from being a net sink of carbon, so sucking carbon out of the air, to actually becoming a net contributor to emissions. Likewise, we see with droughts around the world, the river poor in India, uh, in Madagascar, the first time that we're recording a climate change famine as a result of the droughts that have devastated the local crops. And the floods, we saw one very recently actually uh, in Bangkok. Um, I think that's a regular occurrence, but around the world we see an increasing intensity of floods to the extent that in some parts of, of Germany, for example, villages that have been there for millennia, for centuries, have been wiped away by the rising waters. So it really is an exist existential imperative for us to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees. And to achieve that objective, we need to reach net zero by mid-century. This is what the, um, the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which is a, a global body of, of cli leading climate scientists, have unanimously agreed is, is needed. And so the net zero, which you hear a lot about, is rooted in solid science. And what that requires of us is to halve our emissions by 2030 from 2010 levels. However, as you can well see, we are not on track. Our current commitments, as recorded in, under the Paris Climate Agreement, only take us to about three, uh, um, actually lead to an increase of emissions by 2030 by about 14% when we need to be halving them. And that puts us in a zone of about three degrees of warming. But compounding the ambition gap is also an implementation gap, so that we're actually tacking closer to a world of four degrees of change on current trends. This is if we go on business as usual. While we saw that emissions actually dipped, and this was a hopeful um, aspect of the early days of the pandemic, as economies came to a standstill, we saw emissions dip for a while but they have rebounded very aggressively and we're now back on track for pre-pandemic level uh, increases in global emissions. All of that said, we're seeing some bright spots of progress around the world. In countries, um, in cities, businesses around the world coming behind this goal of net zero and real momentum building. 155 countries have revised their national commitments under the Paris Agreement towards greater ambition we have 83 countries, representing about 73% of the world economy, that have announced net zero targets. Uh, so plans to reach net zero uh, in accordance with the Paris Agreement. And we also have very significantly international multilateral agreements, such as between the G7 and China, to halt overseas financing of coal, one of the main drivers of emissions. We see action in cities, cities all around the world stepping up, about 1,000 cities committing to net zero goals, and we see over 11,000 uh, commitments at the subnational level uh, to addressing climate change. And likewise with companies, companies have really stepped into a leadership position. Over 2,000 companies have signed up to the science-based targets, which is a gold standard for ambition and action on corporate ambition and action on climate. So a lot of you might wonder, is it even is it not too late to reach 1.5? Indeed, scientists are saying that we are already on track to surpass that threshold by the end of this decade. And to that, I will say that every fraction of a degree matters. It is a significantly worse world that we live in and that we uh, bestow to our, our children that has two degrees of warming than a world of 1.5. And a world of three degrees is beyond, um, beyond our imagination, to be honest. So every single fraction of a degree matters. What we've also seen in this world is fragmentation, division, and uh, populism in politics, which have led to some really incredible, um, surreal recent events. Two leaders of G7 countries, who would have thought, have resigned just in the re last month alone. And we see governments coming undone, uh, norms being broken, trust in politics at a low ebb, 
And of course, all of this matters a lot in a context geopolitically as well, where the capacity for collective action, for international cooperation, just as we need it to come together, to, for countries to come together and act in unison, that capacity for collaboration is being weakened. The war in Ukraine has, has significantly, has ushered in a new world, to be honest. We are now at a place where, of multipolarism and a division between blocks. So how to get international collaboration and collective action in that context is going to be a real challenge for the remaining uh, years in this decade. And so this is the world we are in. Vol a volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. And how do businesses get an advantage and, exp and an opportunity in this VUCA world, as we call it? First thing to note is that relax will bounce back. History shows us that, that we've, we've had such disruptions in the past, and we typically bounce back much better. We, we learn from, our, from, from, from these events that give us pause for reflection, let us question what is wrong, what we want to change. And there's been a lot of that reflection going on also with COVID. So with cholera, for example, in the 1800s, we saw as a result of that, that cities totally transformed. They created more green space, Central Park, for example, in, in, in New York, Underground sewage systems became the norm. That was not the case before. And of course, paved roads also became the norm in cities. Now, as Einstein famously said, we're not going to get it to a different place. We're not going to get different results if we do the same thing over and over. So the opportunity, actually, the, what we are called to do, our responsibility, I would say, in this moment, is really to challenge ourselves to imagine the world anew. And I want to... Uh, uh, reflect um, Arundhati Roy's uh, famous quote here in her article in the FT in the early days of the, of the pandemic, uh, which I'll give you a moment to read. So what I'm asking you, you to do today is to imagine your world anew and imagine your role in creating that new world. What have we learned with COVID? What has COVID taught us? Well, a great deal, actually. And one of the things that it has taught us is that is the reality of global interdependence and that we're only as strong as our weakest link. And the pandemic shows that more clearly than anything else. We, no one is safe until everyone is safe. And um, what, what COVID has also showed is that the grave inequalities, the, the severe inequalities that plague our societies actually is at the root of our vulnerability. One other lesson from COVID is that nature is our biggest ally. There is no future without nature that thrives. We also learned a very important lesson with COVID about the cost of inaction and the value of preventative action. What we also saw with COVID is that we have an incredible capacity for change. Societies, entire societies, communities, reinvented how they went about their daily chores, how, how they moved around the cities. Cities reinvented themselves in the wake of, of, of COVID to, uh, to address the challenges of work, the challenges of, of feeding people. So we have an incredible capacity to, to change and to reinvent ourselves, and cities have been very good examples of that. And what COVID has done was create space, political space, for, bold, for the kind of bold change that is needed if we're going to meet our sustainability um, aspirations. And we hear it from world leaders, around, uh, uh, from the leaders around the world, Antonio Guterres, uh, the UN Secretary General, Kristalina Georgieva, the head of the IMF, Angel Gurria, the former Secretary General of the OECD. They are all calling for this recovery to put us on a greener, greener path, because that is good for the economy, it's good for health, it's good for people's well-being, and it's good for, for building resilience. And indeed, this is a popular mandate. We see that there is around the world, in surveys that have been taken, overwhelmingly, people want the recovery to be, to, uh, to be a green one. And there are good reasons for that. There's a strong business case for that as the IMF has, um, has um, articulated in, in its analysis. A green recovery is 
has a bigger job multiply, it builds more resilience, and it, it puts us on track for, for a world that is consistent with 1.5 degrees of global warming, which is where we need to get in terms of su the sustainability journey. However, what we have seen in, in, the, in reality is that much of that fiscal stimulus, the, the COVID stimulus, has actually gone into propping up the old economy rather, rather than building the new economy. And you might wonder why Thailand is not on this chart. This is an, an analysis that was done by Vivid Economics um, and McKinsey of the greenness of, of the stimulus. And um, you might notice Thailand is not on this graph because there actually isn't much of a green stimulus to talk about in the first place in Thailand. In fact, if you looked at the trends in Thailand, they're going in the opposite direction. They were recently, I think, halving or at least very significant cuts in the budget for, uh, for environmental issues in, in the government budget. But this is the most significant lever that governments uh, have at their disposal to nudge the economy onto a more sustainable path of recovery. So what does business leadership look like in a VUCA world, in a world that is volatile and uncertain, complex and ambiguous? Well, firstly, um, climate strategy has to be at the heart of business strategy. If you want to attract talent, if you want to have a reputation uh, with your consumers, if you want to be at the cutting edge of in innovation, uh, beyond compliance, if you want to protect the, your investments from climate impacts, you really need to have climate strategy at the heart of your corporate strategy at the C-suite level rather than in the sustainability department. And this is a, an opportunity story. It's not just a, um, a story of getting compliant it, uh, or, or, or being able to, tr to be, remain competitive. It is a story of seizing the tremendous opportunities, business opportunities that reside in solutioning for a world in which the SDGs are being uh, met and our climate um, targets are being met. $12 trillion worth of business opportunity. This is analysis that was done by the Business and Sustainable Development um, Commission with leaders of big businesses. And uh, across many sectors that Thailand is, is very actively engaged in. So this is an opportunity story for, for Thailand's business to do what these businesses have done, which is not just tick box or incrementally move towards uh, advancing some of the SDGs, but embracing this whole agenda as a roadmap to a more sustainable future for their businesses. And in some cases, in many cases, actually, that means a total transformation of the business. And we've seen very good examples, for example, DSM. M in DSM actually stands for mind. It's Dutch state mind. They were a mining company. Their job was digging coal out of the ground and selling it. They have now become a life sciences company, very successful company. Um, Ford, again, they see that the future is not just selling more cars, selling mobility services. And IKEA, who we all, I guess, have uh, interacted with in our lives, they have realized that their model of keeping selling more furniture is, is a dead-end one. So they are shifting to a very different model, business model, where they're actually going to be at the heart, the engine of a circular economy, helping repair, helping sell back, uh, second-hand um, uh, furniture, and total transformation, also looking at their, their, their entire value chain, the canteens, the food that they serve, etc. So these are very good examples of corporate action, corporate leadership, of the kind that, that is needed. Um, secondly, and this is, the, I, I guess, probably the most crucial point in, in my, uh, that I want to make today, is that... Um, a lot of the, the issues that we face as businesses are of a systemic nature. And a lot of action, on the other hand, is, is very much tackling symptoms rather than root causes. So my second point is address root causes, not symptoms. And if you want to do that, there are three, there are a lot of systemic issues, of course, but the three main ones that underpin and drive all the others are overconsumption or addiction to consumption the embeddedness of inequity in our system and the improper exertion of influence to enforce a status quo bias in, in public investments, private investments, 
decisions, et cetera. So let me touch very briefly. I'll walk very quickly through this. But um, on, in terms of consumption, uh, we're looking at a massive increase, 2.5 billion people moving into cities, moving into the middle class in the next 30 years. What that represents on business as usual trends is a tripling of resources that we need to extract from nature to meet that growing demand for consumption. And this is at a time where we're already hitting up against planetary boundaries. We're running out of resources and of land. So this is obviously, you know, we're already beyond the carrying capacity of the Earth to meet current consumption. So equity really is not something that you do separately. It is the path and the, the most impactful path to unlocking ambitious climate action. And the third point, uh, systemic point, is th about power and how, how it is used and wielded by wealthy um, uh, individuals and organizations and businesses around the world to drive outcomes, perverse outcomes, and, and, and maintain the status quo. And we see that even with, with organizations that are, say all the right thing, right? They turn up in the right fora and say all the right thing, but then with the other, uh, when they turn their backs and walk out the door, they're actively lobbying with, another, with, with the, the, the left hand to undo or, or to push the government in the opposite direction. And uh, you will have seen, you will see this pattern emerge uh, on the business pages of the newspapers if you just alert to it. It is, some, it is uh, a, an incoherence that undermines the entire intent of sustainability. You cannot try and be sustainable in your operations, but then lobby for government action and policies that drive unsustainability. And so the, the uh, gold standard for, for corporate responsibility uh, that speaks to the political power that businesses have is for businesses to be advocates, to align their, their strategy, and to allocate their budgets according with their sustainability commitments, and to be transparent and disclose um, their progress and um, govern themselves in a way that is consistent with, with that commitment and that journey. So the question to ask yourself as a business is, do you know which trade organization or, or industry organization your company belongs to? And have you examined what policies and practices these organizations are promoting versus your sustainability mission? What actions can you take to change that status quo? And what actions are your company taking to influence government action on climate? So the third point we already touched on this is be transparent. There's growing skepticism about corporate action around the world, concern about greenwashing. And this relates to the fact that 2050 is far away. Uh, there's a lack of accountability when businesses say, oh, we'll, we'll aim to be net zero by 40 years from now or 50 years from now. There, there is a real uh, risk here in undermining the trust that businesses rely on uh, for the license to operate and their um, ability to, to thrive uh, uh, in the future. So action has to be consistent with long-term goals. There needs to be near-term action that, that is uh, course consistent. There needs to be verifiable plans that are opened up and transparent progress needs to be communicated. Um, that is exactly what the Science-Based Targets Initiative aims to do. It aims to help businesses set targets for long-term emissions reductions in line with what science says is needed, but also identify a pathway and then open up their uh, data so that third-party validators can come in and help verify and validate uh, their progress and support that progress along the way. And it's very encouraging to see a growing number of companies join this initiative from around the world. Uh, every day we have many uh, big companies joining us and um, we'd like to invite you all, as well as business leaders, to consider um, joining in this, um, in this initiative. The fourth thing um, I would say, um, I would urge uh, uh, you as business leaders to consider is how you fit in with a broader ecosystem of change. So firstly, understand, think in terms of the ecosystem of change and, and understand what your role is within that. Um, coalitions, catalytic collaboration is really needed across scales and across sectors to uh, break out of the, um, 
the systemic kind of grip hold that we, we've been talking about earlier. And so coalitions, partnerships with organizations um, such as the World Resources Organization or others, solution pro providers, um, innovative uh, formations or, 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 or constellations of action are, are really needed. And because what, what is uh, individuals moving alone, no single organization or company can meet the, uh, the, the ambition of uh, sustainability and it really requires the whole ecosystem of social change to act together. And so identifying your um, position and your role within this complex landscape is going to be very important. Lastly, consider how nature can be your ally in this journey, in this sustainability journey. Nature is key to fighting climate change, uh, both as a sink and as, uh, of, of, um, as of carbon um, in the air, um, a sequester of carbon, and also uh, to build resilience to climate impacts. Nature is key also to feeding a growing, growing population. Uh, we'll need to include, increase the calorific output of our food systems by about 50% by mid-century to meet the growing demand, uh, the demands of a growing population. And we need to do so in a way that does not encroach on further on nature. And we, nature also has shown us that it, it really helps strengthen our economies and that transitioning, in fact, to a nature-positive econ economy can create 35, 395 million jobs and about $10 trillion in business opportunities and value by 2030. And I'd be happy to refer you to, to the analysis that underpins these numbers. So the task is uh, an arduous one, is a long one. Uh, this is a journey uh, rather than a, um, uh, a sprint. And uh, the task becomes harder the longer we delay it. And um, the window for us to get a grip on these issues, the runaway climate change, um, loss of biodiversity, the window for us to keep within a safe operating zone for the planet is rapidly narrowing. These years ahead, these seven years ahead, and this is what the, uh, the science of the inter Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change tells us very clearly, that these years ahead will be crucial for securing a safe landing zone for ourselves by 2030. And um, I posit to you that in this, in this landscape where we need to be addressing and engaging with systemic levers of change, there is no neutral ground. There is no space from which we can be outside of it. So we're either going to be part of the problem or part of the solution, and that is a choice that we all need to make as individuals and as businesses. And I'll leave you on this, these famous last words by um, John E. Lewis. If not us, then who? If not now, then when? And this is really a call for all of you to engage um, and for us to partner on this epic journey that lies ahead. And to conclude, I'd also like to thank uh, Thai Republica for their partnership for making this event possible today and bringing us all here, and also to the Thailand Stock Exchange. It's been a real pleasure, and I invite you also to reach out if you have any questions, if you want to um, continue this discussion. I would love to hear from you. Um, my email is uh, in the presentation. Uh, it's actually a very easy one to remember. Um, it's leo, L-E-O, at wri.org. So please do reach out. We'd love to hear from you. Thank you. Kaupen